Good morning, traders and investors. Welcome to Monday's St. Patrick's Day edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Brought to you by the good people at Options House. Joe, are you as excited about this week as I am? You have no idea, Joe. Although, I can actually recall a St. Patty's Day walking around in a t-shirt. And I don't know what is going on with this. It's 8 degrees outside right Every now. Every St. Patty's Day where I was at Michigan State, it was shorts and a t-shirt. And it was great. And then right when I left, it started getting cold on St. Patty's Day. I think there might be a correlation. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cold without you, Jake. I know. But do you do you wanna do you wanna uh, just tantalize our listeners, Joe, with a little bit what we have for today's show? I do just a little bit, Joe, but not too much. Just a little teaser. But in case everyone didn't know already, we have Alan Green Rush Brockstein in the office today. That's in uh, 420 Investor will be live on the show from the Benzinga headquarters. Isn't that pretty sweet, Joel? Yeah. We also have. Victor Ricciardi, Behavioral Finance, that's at Victor Ricciardi on Twitter. He is a uh, an expert in uh, determining behaviors when it comes to financial markets. And I'm expecting an extremely slow week in the markets. Why is that, Joel? Well, because everyone has to be filling out their brackets. Ah, you know? yes. Yeah, with Western Michigan getting in, the desk well represented here. Go Broncos, uh, baby. The, yep, the only one we're missing is Wayne State. The Tartars didn't quite make it in there. Oakland didn't make it either. Oakland actually sometimes makes it. Yeah. Yeah, but Does uh, Oakland even have contact sports? Oh, yes. Like they, well, basketball is not contact, unless you play the way Michigan <laughs> yeah, State plays. Unless you're in the Big Ten. Uh, yeah, but, uh, boy, we've got to get to the news here. And the s and are already trading up 10 this morning. And, of course, is related to Crimea. Jake, can you give us a lowdown on that? You know, it it kind of shocks me. There's a few major macro events that happened over the weekend. And I'll dive into Crimea in a second. But we also had North Korea launching missiles into the South Japan Sea. Uh, was it 10 rockets out there and just, just kind of proved they could reach that area, which you would think would cause unrest. And then also you have the Crimean vote. Um, so both of those things, sh I would think, would cause you know, a dip in the markets, but in this case it caused a rally. It's incredible. So 95% of Crimeans voted to secede from Ukraine. So uh, that's is as much of you know an underline to the vote as you, you could get, whether that's doctored, whether that's you know truthfully what the people wanted. I, I guess that's up to debate. I, I'm not sure where that goes. But uh, the big question right now is will Moscow actually annex uh, Crimea? And I think that was kind of the natural progression, but that's not happened yet. Um, Western leaders are saying they refuse to recognize the vote, um, which in, in the case if this is a popular vote, I think their hands are kind of tied and they have to recognize it. So that's kind of interesting. U.S. Security Council did attempt to uh, block the vote and say that they weren't going to recognize it. Obviously, Russia has a veto there. They vetoed it themselves. And then, you know, when this happened, uh, 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 Brent crude went over 108, while, while WTI, uh, for any of you guys following it, is still in the 98s right now. So um, a lot of economic sanctions are expected to come out today. You know, everybody, you, you, the uh, the threats from Kerry and other Western leaders last week about those, uh, those sanctions, uh, I think the expectation is that those will be announced today. Uh, so keep an eye out for an announcement sometime probably around like 10 ish I would think 10 or, or 10 to 12 is when I would expect a press conference about some of these sanctions so do you know when those missiles went off just a, you know approximately I believe those were Saturday uh, Saturday okay I, I got the news alert Saturday afternoon I think it was like Saturday at like 4 30 p.m so I don't know what that is over there I guess that's Sunday in uh, Korea. Okay, because that it probably explains the extremely weak open in the S and P yeah. 500 futures. Uh, opened 18.32 and a quarter. We dipped all the way down to 18.23.50, which takes out the lows from last week by nearly 10 handles. Somehow we've turned around and rallied all the way back up to 18.45.75. Currently trading up ten dollars and twenty-five cents at 18.43 and a quarter. Dennis, we already got a day's range in already, and it's not even 8.05. That's crazy. 22-point range here overnight. Jake, did the, you say what time that vote was at? Because we're just trying to see if that is right when the market started uh, rallying. No, I can was right look when into that vote, and I can uh, send it over to you guys. I it was. Uh, I, don't, I guess it would I'd be, imagine that's the catalyst here, It would be real though. early morning yesterday, I believe, is when that would be. So uh, I guess I think it was like around... I, I don't know the exact the time, time changes yeah. are going to get us. It's probably exactly. eight hours uh, ahead of us, Roughly, I would imagine. Yeah. So that's why I was thinking like early morning for the U.S. here. So uh, that, that's where I'd, I'd place it. 
Wow, incredible rally here, obviously, in the S&P futures here overnight. As it looked like it was going to be a disaster there around 6 o'clock last night, Sunday. And we've bounced back, and we are now up 10 handles. So, Joel, what are the technicals saying here now? I'm just leery of idea already having a 22-point range here. You know, I mean, it's already, that already uh, exceeds the average daily range for the index here. So in order to keep this baby going, I mean, you're going to need some more good news coming out. Uh, you know, maybe something comes out on that airplane or whatever. But to me, just uh, too big of a range just to continue to rally up here. Look for a little back and fill. When looking at that pre-market chart that you got up there, it looks like we've had three or four hours now where we've kind of just been hanging out here between 1842 and 1844. So we've had a pretty strong move there, just up around 4 a.m. open in the equities, and all of a sudden up there to 1844, and we've kind of just consolidated here. So Good um, number you for you, start... though. Great what number. Got? I got 1846 yeah. and a quarter was Friday's high. We've hit 45.75 in the pre-market, so you call that 18.46, just a huge level. We get through that, I will see continued more upside. As of right now, bears are making a stand at 18.46. Remember that 18.46 number back in the day at the beginning of the year, too? We kept struggling to get through that and struggling to get through that and struggling to get through that. There was like three, four, five, six highs up there in between 18.44 and 18.46. It's funny that we rally all the way up and then we start to struggle in that same area here once again. So do you think that area has relevance still? I know we're trading a different contract, but that 1846 number was huge at the beginning of the year. The market has a memory, Dennis. The market has a memory. So you're saying that 1846 is going to be big here again today. You think the market, the, the bears make a stand there and block yep. this thing from going yep. higher at that level? I think it's, yep. I think it's going to be a big level for the whole week. 1846. Joel's giving you your weekly number there, folks. Keep that in mind here. We are three and a half points off of it right now. Let's quickly take a look at gold and crude here as well. Start with gold. We are getting a little bit of a pullback here. Overnight, gold has got up to 1392. We have pulled back significantly off those highs. We are now down $2, trading at 1376. So obviously with the market rallying up, Gold now moving opposite the market like it should. Yeah, it finally gold finally acted like gold. Thank you, gold. Uh, rallied off the open as the uh, S and P's cascaded lower, as you can see here. Let's go to the interday chart. This is for all you 6 p.m. traders that weren't watching uh, the tournament selection show. Uh, there you popped up to 1392, and then as the market turned around and went north. Gold has went south, just resting on the low of the days. Level to keep an eye on the upside here, beside your interday low is 75 even. Thursday and Friday's lows from 64.90 to 68.20. Three point range, let's call 66.50 your major support in gold. Let's take a look at crude here too, which is just trading slightly down. You want to do the April or the May? The Mays are out there too. Are you sticking on the April? Uh, we I on just, the crude. I go with the front month contract and my, with my slash. And let's see what day. We'll uh, stay with the April then. And okay. the April high overnight, we've been as high as ninety nine thirty nine, as low as ninety eight fifty four. We're about ten cents off those lows right now, trading ninety eight sixty five. So looking a little bit weaker here this morning on crude. Yeah, you know, uh, that did pop. Uh, well, that actually came down. Wow, crude may not want to be trading this puppy today. Very, very choppy. Spiked up when the S&Ps were going down and gold was going up. Then just consolidated at 99 for several hours and broke down. Uh, minor support at the low that you have intraday low at 98.54. But I just want to alert our traders to the three lows on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday between 97.55 and 98.06. So uh, with 97.67 being Thursday's low, that's your major support. Uh, buck away from there, though, so we'll see what happens in today's session. Let's take a quick look at some of the top S&P components here. And you were looking at this Exxon Mobil chart here, and it's just setting up. Holy cow, looking at all these lows we've had here in this 93.25 area. We're bouncing a little bit here this morning, obviously, with the overall market. Uh, 93.63 was ticking just after 4 o'clock this morning. Hasn't had any trades really since 4, though. Uh, bit up at 93.73, off for 93.99. So we're getting a little bit of a rally here with the overall market. But that 93 and a quarter level is huge. 
change. Yeah, it was uh, your low 29 on yesterday. Then you go back a couple weeks. And I just think also what's really interesting about this whole $93 level is that that's when uh, Warren made his announcement. That's, you know, obviously Warren was buying much cheaper but it came out, uh, you know, pop closed in 93, got a pop up to 94, traded much higher. We'll back at that area. You got to respect that major support. Hey, did you Speaking, guys? Did you go ahead, Brent? Did you guys see that Cure Green Mountain will be joining the S&P 500? Ooh, yeah, exciting news. Green, Green Mountain's gonna join the S&P yeah, 500. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was announced late on Friday afternoon, about 5:15. GMCR. So we've got That's it right. trading at. Up $3 here right now. Yep, should be trading higher 15. on that. Wow, did they say who they were booting? Um, I could go find out. Yeah, I'd, yeah, you did get a pop. We'll just give our traders the pre-market high or after hours high. Got up to uh, as high as 115.92 here. Uh, that exceeds Friday's high. Uh, minor resistance, uh, 116.40, 119. Uh, uh, funds will be forced to buy this thing here. I know uh, Brent doesn't like saying Cure Green Mountain. He has to say Cure Green Mountain now because they, they, they changed their name. So thanks for that information, Brent. Just looking at the chart on this thing, obviously had the big gap and go there. Wasn't that after uh, they announced the deal with Coke yep. that it had the big gap and go? Then pulled back, trying to come back. But now you got that rounding bottom. Now the thing starts to go here again. Getting out of the S&P 500 typically will add 3 to 5% to a stock. So actually, if you consider the market's up 10 points, it's probably a 116, not even that much. But I mean, this one's a volatile puppy and funny stuff happens with this thing. But just from a statistical standpoint, it's usually what a stock is worth when it gets added. Brent, did you find out who got kicked then? Uh, nope, I'll did, check right did now. You, did, oh, three to five percent immediately, or are you talking over? Yeah, no, usually the next day. Usually the next day, on a, when a stock gets added to the S&P 500, it's usually worth about three to five percent, depending on which company. Well, usually if they're getting out of there, they're usually around the same market cap anyways. So just from a statistical standpoint, I know just from trading these things, they usually pop about three to five percent. Okay. So, and you're kind of in there. It's up 2.75 percent right now, so you're kind of in that realm, I guess. So. Green um, mount, green you want to talk about... Yeah, who is it? It will be. It is WPX Energy Whiskey Papa X Ray is the ticker. WPX and it is not even moving on in this. That's interesting. Usually, is it going to the S and P? Are they moving it down to um? Uh, well, so, like one? sometimes what happens with these is they're just replacing components that are going to be acquired. So I'm not sure about go. WXP or WPX, but that could be something here. I'm going to have to do a little bit more research. All right, we'll let Brent get on that. Let's um, look at just a couple other quick S&P components, too, before we get on to a little bit of Barron's talk. I want to talk about this General Electric chart because this thing has a huge level that it was coming into before this huge rally today. I was eyeing this thing up just around the $25 level. It didn't quite get there, though, on Friday. only got down to 2509 And now with the overall market up 10 points, this thing's popping big time. We're trading up at 2538 here right now. Joel, what's the chart saying on this one? Ah, uh, GE. They haven't taken a look at this one in a while, though. Let's take a look. We have popped here uh, in the pre-market, trading up at 25.37. Quite a steep decline from uh, 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 from Thursday's high of 26 bucks. I will alert our traders, though, that, that trading at 25.37, we are trading one tick from Friday's highs, so you will need some follow-through that. And then besides that, is there some huge institutional size at the $26 level that uh, kept the lid on it? I'd imagine there was something there. We opened right up on Thursday, right at 26 on the kisser, and immediately gave it all back. It was obviously opening up 30 cents on that GE filing the IPO for their North American retail finance unit. And everybody took that opportunity to sell the stock and obviously closed much weaker even that day. But that was the big sell-off in the market, too. So everything was really weak on that Thursday. And then Friday, we just kind of hung out. And I thought I might get a shot at this thing just under 25, where you got multiple lows, that whole 24, 24. Uh, 2495 area. We would open down the 10 points like we were at 6 o'clock last night. We probably would have got a shot on this GE. But now we're getting the rally here. So we'll have to see if uh, some traders come in to take some profits here on General Electric. 
Also, let's just quickly look at Apple because Apple was starting to look okay there on Wednesday. And then, obviously, the big sell-off in the market on Thursday bashed it down. And then Friday, Apple got bashed even farther down. Some of the moment was even getting hurt there uh, and week a close on Friday for Apple. It's bouncing back $3 here. But what do you think of the Apple chart? You know who made a good call on this last week? Who was that? Nick Shaheen. Nick Shaheen. Yeah, what was he? I remember he had. His, what was he saying he, about it again? Uh, it had the credit spread. Uh, he had uh, had the upgrade, and uh, you know he, he just thought that it really was going to have a hard time getting through five forty. Uh, yeah, so ba- he was right, yeah, and then yeah, right. Uh, based Depends, on yeah. the weeklies, probably saw a lot of open interest there in the options. Figured they would carve people out. Thursday got to five thirty nine sixty six. Quite a reversal of fortune here, all the way down to 523 even with a 524.69 close. I'll just alert our traders that if you can get another low down to that 523 area, it's buffeted by two other lows from March 28th and, uh, or excuse me, Feb 28th and March 3rd at 522.12 and 522.88. So good support level for Apple. We got GGBs excited to talk about the Jinko Solar earnings here this morning. Symbol or JA Solar, sorry, uh, JA Solar is trading up here about 15% right now. They did report earnings here this morning of 16 cents, and the revenue blew the numbers away. 357.3 million versus 291.75 million. Uh, they're looking and seeing a profit for 2014. So here's a solar company that's going to make some money. No way. And JASO is off to the races here, Joel. They were leaning the right way on this one on Friday because as the market was kind of closing weak, this sucker was closing strong, and they are right. And this stock is popping up big time here this morning. Uh, let's look at the pre-market trading first to get our parameters. We traded over fourteen dollars, so traders should Whoa. Uh, should jot down fourteen thirty and a little bit of volume traded there as well. Uh, after getting to that vaulted level here, traded all the way back down to twelve eighty-two, and now just hanging out at the thirteen dollar level. So thirteen, call it support. Call it minor support in my book here. Uh, if you really get a decline, they start to take this back. Uh, you did have a really nice resistance uh, forming at the 1150 level. Well, you're not going to get a shot at 1150, maybe not today, but uh, that will be your major support if the market does go into decline uh, to fill the gap. And also, that puppy almost doubled its volume on Friday, too. Is that interesting? Uh, Out of the earnings, yeah. yeah. It's so, already traded 274,000 shares here today, so I'd imagine the volume's going to be quite heavy here after the earnings report. You did have the high of the move, 1280 back on November the 14th, so i got to think we pull back another 35 cents, maybe get a few people scrambling to either if they were caught short this thing covering or maybe get some uh, dippers there saying, well, the 1280 was a resistance before, maybe that'll hold. So that number has some relevance too. Really, if you want to really go out to try to find resistance, though, Joel, you probably got to go back to 2011 pricing here. And I don't really see much on the chart. I'm trying to look here. You had a 1285 in the week of October. And then I'm looking back in September, there was uh, where we had a big gap down from $18. So there's really not much that, uh, that much above this area here. So yeah, I don't know. This could be on a bit of a breakout. Yeah, that's a good number. I mean, I, I, you know, I'd be if I had this in my portfolio, I'd be more apt if it doesn't get follow through immediately off the open. Maybe they take some chips off the table and let it drift back. Uh, I just don't see this thing being a buck sixty-eight going up two, three, four bucks today. Here's your wild child of the day, ICPT. It doesn't look that wild when you bring it up here right now, but wait till you see the pre-market chart. Stock's down 12 bucks right now, so you're like $450 stock. Well, that's not that big a deal. Um, but if you look, they reported earnings after the bell on Friday, Sneaky. and they took this stock down to $368. Holy cow. They knocked basically 100 points off on the earnings report. But then this morning, they come out with this phase three Poise trial. I think I'm saying that right. And it met the primary endpoint. And the stock has been off to the races ever since. So a horrible Friday after the bell, but a pretty decent Monday pre-market has the stock getting all of its losses back. Uh, Dennis, 360? I got 340. You got 340? Yeah. Oh, wow. I've seen 340? Three, 368 was the one that I gave you, uh, Dennis. Wow. Oh, Brandon gave me the wrong. But oh, it, it, regardless, so it knocked over. So 120 points this thing knocked off on Friday after the bell. Right. And uh, the prints were, uh, just to give you, this is for the entire bracket, or the 15-minute bracket. 
3,500 yeah. shares. So hardly nothing. <laughs> and then the next bracket, when it started to bounce, 4,300 shares, 9,000 shares, 2,000 shares. So, I mean, if you're if you're trading this thing in the pre-market with any kind of size, I mean, be extremely careful because obviously someone saw that headline number just stuck their fingers down their throat, puked all over the desk, and uh, <laughs> you know, went down to 340, and then now we're getting a bounce back up uh, all the way back to the 450 level. That's such ridiculous pre-market trading. I'm just going to look at the dailies here, and that's what I'm going to pay attention to if I was trading this thing. Kind of had a nice recovery up after you know the wild uh, wild trading that you had in early January, but uh, you made a high on Friday at 484.99. That's been the recent high of the move. Uh, better number to me is the close 462.26. That would be an important level. That's the all-time highest close for it. Uh, you really have to keep an eye on that. People looking to get out of their mark would need another 11-point rally. So that's my number for the week in um, ICPT 462.26. You got a little Barron's update there for us, Joel, because we had some Fanny Freddy covers. They were talking Herbalife. What do you got there? What was Barron saying this weekend? Uh, they were just, uh, they, you know, they started out, there was just crazy activity in Fanny and Freddy last week. And those stocks, bulletin board stocks that are, Basically bankrupt companies, aren't they? Uh, uh, yeah. Had a stealth rally. This uh, Fannie Mae got over six bucks, six thirty-five. It got to on the eleventh, and then they had that Senate vote that said, "Hey, we're just going to wind this thing down over the next couple of years." And traders just hit the skids on that. Uh, came all the way down from the six-dollar level all the way to the low threes. Cut it in half. Uh, but what you had, you kind of had a nice formation on the daily if we'd been looking at this. You had, look at that, a triple bottom, 323 and a quarter, 330. Then you got the bounce back up to 413. So uh, if you do get another breakdown, let's keep an eye on that three and a quarter area. Uh, trading up a little bit here at 4.33. That's above Friday's uh, Friday's high at 426. So see what happens there. If not, it might float back up. But, uh, but I'll tell you, that, that move by the Senate uh, really scared traders. Yeah, and some of the preferred stocks had bounced all the way and had come from like basically pennies a share, talking 20, 30, 40 cents a share. Some of these got up to like $12, $13. Um, and, and on the par value is 25, so basically got half their losses back, speculating that the preferred shareholders might get paid out, actually. And obviously, the Senate vote is hurting them, too. And a lot of the preferred stocks got hurt there on that vote there as well. So, Fannie and Freddie, you know, when you're buying basically bankrupt companies, speculating that there might be something, you know, to get some residual value or they might pay them out, it, it, it's a lot of speculation. It's nothing more than, you know, a crapshoot, basically, or a lottery ticket play. If you're putting hard-earned money or money you can't afford to lose into these plays, I think there's a lot better places for your money. So, but if you like gambling, I think this lottery ticket plays, um, obviously, you know, the gamble didn't work out there on Tuesday. I don't know. The stocks are bouncing back a bit, but I'm totally hands-off on this stuff. Even the over-the-counter stuff, it's so hard, man. It's all speculative. Well, also, you got a couple of big hedge funds. You know, they think that they can, uh, you know, what is it, Ackman, David Tepper, a couple, of, I'm not exactly sure who it is, but they they see value. They see billions of dollars worth of value and billions of dollars worth of profits that are being withheld from shareholders, bondholders, and, and uh, taxpayers alike. And uh, obviously, it's not there or else they'd be paying it out. But, uh, yeah, the fact that uh, keep your eye on the wire on something like this. I mean, if that Senate vote does come to fruition, that they're actually – going to be winding these things down uh whew, what would their value be then should be zero <laughs> <laughs> should be zero like they almost almost were priced after 2009 i mean look at the fannie mae chart fnma the stock started the year at 30 cents so a lot of speculation that oh maybe the shareholders are going to get something that's what it is it's all speculation on getting a possible getting something back here you know these were 50 60 70 dollar stocks there prior to the financial crisis but you know obviously everything we lost companies during the financial crisis we basically lost these companies too so they're just gambling on basically the bankrupt shares and i don't know that's a gamble that i'm not willing to take what were they saying about herbal life there in barons they had a little article on that too yeah. obviously we had the big you know, concerns there last week you know stock gapping down and then trying to find a home but kind of just been hanging out here in the 50s for a couple of days now 
Yeah, I mean, you got the inquiries going on is making uh, you know shareholders a little bit nervous here. They didn't really give any definitive, uh, you know, which way they were leaning on it, but just the fact that this is out there and lingering on the stock. Yeah, yeah, uh, got a great level there. If you're an Herbalife trader here, we are trading uh, down 23 cents at uh, 57.23. Uh, the panic low at 54.59 is safe for now, okay? But you got a double bottom from Thursday and Friday at 57.05, 57.13. So if that's taken out, there's not a lot of not a lot of support until you get down to that 54.59 area. It will just be a question of whether or not you know shorts are say, okay, this is it for now, and they try and bring it in. Or some more bad news comes out, uh, but the low in the move stands at 54.59. Let's take a look at the new skin chart with that. Obviously, NUS has been moving right with the Herbalife headlines here. Uh, new skin was actually sold off hard on that whole investigation news. Then it popped back up a little bit, and then um, Friday kind of was closing week again. Uh, 71.54 here, but what do you think of the NUS chart here, Joel? Just consolidation here. Uh, breakdown, uh, you've had three attempts at the low here. If you're looking at a swing trade, 67.51 was a low, 68.55 with a low, and then uh, last week you got down to 68.02. That's the big level. You're trading up a little bit. Uh, that level's, you know, as long it holds there, it looks like it's just kind of in this training range. Uh, from 68, uh, the upper end of the range is in the $86 level. Basically a 20-point range over the last month or so. And now you're kind of almost, uh, well, not quite in the middle of it. But uh, look for the middle of that area of 75, 76 uh, to be minor resistance and you, you know, for your swing area. But uh, as long as that 67, what was the official? The low, the washout low on that day where we really went down was 67.51, and then we obviously bounced back. And then uh, three days ago off the Herbalife news, it's got down at 68.02. So, I mean, they are defending the whole 67.5, 68 area. I think if it took out 67.5, I'd start to get real scared because you've definitely had some people picking bottoms here for the last two months trying to accumulate the stock, saying, oh, well, we just watched the stock go from 140 down to 70 bucks, basically <laughs> cut in half here. And they're coming in, well, you know, the buy the dippers are coming in here thinking that they're going to get some of these losses back. A lot of times they do, but there's still, you know, some a lot of questions to be answered here. And this is going to be a headline stock. And, you know, you can come in one day, a bad headline comes out and this thing could gap down again. Obviously, a good headline comes out and this thing could gap up again. So I almost think it's just kind of waiting around here for the next headline. Okay. What else to got from Barron's Joel there was some speculative plays in there yeah you know, you know they're, like they're going they're going uh you know now with the market uh you know they couldn't get Tim Melvin in so they they did an article on uh, on bargains <laughs> out there and bargain uh, stocks bargain, like bargain stocks. stocks yeah yeah talk to me about bargain stocks either either based on a PE or price to book ratio uh the first one I want to talk to about is uh GM GM was all over the news last week and oh, yeah. it seemed just as the bad you know bad news all came out on Friday uh, uh Kyle Bass came out was defending the stock here uh very significant level here at a double close 3409 from Thursday and Friday low of the move been 3357 he just thinks they're going to navigate their way through this uh this recent uh uh inquiry and, uh, you know, maybe make a payout or in it, but they're still bringing in so much cash here. You know, he looks to stock to, you know, rebound back to the mid-40s. Uh, two lows, 3357 87 if you are trying to pick a bottom here. Uh, that's the lowest the stock is trading in quite some time. Uh, that support is also backed by some support that you had uh, back in uh, mid uh, 2013 here, July so, and August. Yeah, so if you're if you're putting times. your faith in Kyle Bass and uh, you know the low um, uh, the low PE on it, uh, you know General Motors may look attractive here. Uh, the other ones that they talked about um, as far as low PEs, I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen this in a, in a, in Barron's. Two weeks in a row, they're really pumping this Met Life, and uh, <laughs> did too much for it last week. It is coming down to support here, so we'll keep an eye on that. And then uh, stocks that they like on uh, price to book, um, actually three out of the four that I jotted down were kind of like your oil services related or, or uh, mineral companies. Uh, 
Apache, Cliff Natural Resources, and Noble Drilling. Uh, then the other one they mentioned is uh, is Bank America here. And uh, what they're anticipating on Bank America is that um, they get the okay from the uh, U.S. government, you know, to uh, inc- uh, or reinstate their dividend or increase their dividend. And uh, they think that uh, that will attract a whole nother sector of investors, your value investors and your dividend players. So that's um, that's uh, that's what they're looking for in Bank America. I'm just looking back at some of those other ones you were mentioning, the oil services plays like Cliff's Natural Resources there. They all have something in common when you're looking. What would you say? CLF, yeah. you had NBL, and what was the other one? Uh, NE. Isn't Noble dr- drilling NE? Oh, you had NE. Okay. Oh, no, well, this NBL is Noble Noble Energy. There's Noble Energy, and then there's obviously uh, Noble Corp. So, yeah, there's two no- different Nobles there. So, which one were they talking about? Was it NE? Yeah, maybe they got their symbol wrong because... Uh, well, you, there's yeah. two Nobles, so... Well, that's a... What was the, there was a third one, too. Apache. It's Cliff. Apache. Apache. That was the other one. But look at Apache and look at Cliff. Both of these stocks are sitting there on their lows, man. And we know, you know, this has been the momentum market. It seems like the stocks that, you know, we get weaker there. And I'm just looking at that Apache chart, APA. Look at the consolidation that we've had here in the stock, Joel. Between, you know, the last two weeks, we have just been consolidating like crazy, basically in a dollar, dollar and a half range here. Does this not look like it's sitting on a cliff? Yeah, but every time I say that, and it's support, know, the, and <laughs> the thing, you know, the thing rallies. So uh, we'll see what's uh, Apache. You know, they had a big run up. I'm trying to think that they, well, they they did the old run up on splitting the companies. Remember they did that? Uh, that was a while ago. That must have been the run up. Boom. Let's go to the weekly here. Must have been part of this run up from the 88 over the 90 dollar level. I remember that news, but. I mean, it's coming down into good support, and they're looking at it just, you know, on a uh, 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 price-to-book valuation. So we'll see how. Oh, yeah. yeah, If this thing takes out the 77.31 low on February the 5th, I don't want to be long it. That's the one thing. So as long as it stays above there, I guess you can try to pick bottoms here. Below 77.31, I think I'm cutting out because that chart is just not that pretty from a long perspective. But who knows? Stocks turn and then they come in. The buy the dippers could come in on something like this. But I'm not in love with that chart. Okay, we got uh, we got to get Alan on in a few seconds here. But uh, Jared yeah. popped in with a good question about a good website uh, showing pre-market uh, prices of individual stocks. I mean. Uh, I guess it's what the platform, you would need a, a platform with some dedicated uh, data on it. Um, uh, yeah, Options House, or there's a few other out there, but uh, then if you have any, uh, any suggestions for that. I know a lot of the, a lot of the you know, free, free websites do not include that. Yeah, like I don't know because I have so much data here. I never really looked for free stuff myself. We'll ask uh, the news team there, though, to hunt down maybe for tomorrow. We'll try to find a good website that has updated pre-market pricing there on their website. Uh, obviously, you know, <laughs> if you have you know retail broker interactive brokers, most of your retail brokers obviously have it. Um, even interact or but there's other ones too, like Options House. You can get pricing from the different brokers here, but um, I don't know about, about on the websites there for free so we'll let brent hunt that down we'll get back to you on that one jared okay and uh just going back up here in the chat colts lock uh the state's d shutting down micron i I don't know if the state department is shutting down micron i don't think i quite see any news of that effect but i will say uh with this stock uh we were talking about the 25 dollar level last week uh made it hit that resistance with a vengeance came down on thursday uh, now you're really coming in very good support under the $23 level. 23.60 and 23.73 uh, coincides with the low you had at 23.71. So perhaps um, a trade the range here uh, for Micron. All right, we're going to take a quick break here, Dennis, and we're going to bring on uh, Alan Brockstein of the 420 Investor uh, and get his outlook on the cannabis sector. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, traders and investors. A special Monday morning uh, interview here with Alan Brockstein of the 420 Investor. Welcome to the D here, coming off from Texas. What do you think about this weather, Alan? Oh, it's awesome. It's uh, I think it was nine degrees this morning or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And what's <laughs> a, little, a little cooler than down in Texas? Uh, just a little. I think like sixty there. Okay. Well, you're uh, you're in town here. We're going to be doing a special interview uh, exclusive on Benzinga later on today. We're going to be putting that out with Alan. Uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna touch on a few topics here, and uh, we'll be covering a lot of things in much more detail uh, on our our interview later on. But um, you know, Alan, just. Just give us a little history. How long have you been following this sector, you know, overall and, and also just from a, a technical perspective? So I didn't even know about the sector until uh, 13 months ago. Wow. And so it's been in, in this space. That's like it makes me a uh, senior citizen, actually, apparently. <laughs> but uh, no, it's been really it was last August that I did the kind of the 180 and really started to open my eyes to the opportunity and it's just really blown me away the last few months and uh and what and what you know what got you interested in it was it an article was it something that you saw on tv it was some research that you were doing right so there was a, a very negative article on one of the leading companies on seeking alpha and uh the article turned out not to be really such a great article but it just opened my eyes i've been a, a lifelong libertarian have always believed in uh the legalization of of a lot of things but cannabis being one of them and uh, but I, I was really surprised as a financial analyst to see kind of the low quality of these companies and the high valuation at the same time. So it's kind of trying to get that whole thing triangulated in terms of the opportunities, but also the the really uh, bogus companies that were kind of captivating early attention. I'm just looking here just at the charts in the last year of some of these stocks, and it's absolutely incredible. When you bring up a one-year chart of like PHOT or even GWPH or the Canadian one FIT, they're all the same thing. They've all went from pennies a share. Well, GWPH was eight bucks, but they're all up like a thousand percent or two thousand percent here in the last year. The sector has just been the hottest thing in the last year. Do you think these runs can continue or is it going to be about picking the right stocks and stock selection now here going forward, Alan? You know, if you had asked me that a few months ago, I would have told you uh, that they were already ahead of themselves and they've doubled or tripled since then. I mean, if you've only tripled, only tripled, you're a bad stock. But uh, I know, it's crazy. They're, they're just, it's, they're all so strong. I think uh, what I'm really excited about is, and I've been saying this for a while, and I think I might have mentioned on your show a couple shows ago, we're about to get some really good companies. Uh, there's a NASDAQ IPO on the way, and there's some reverse mergers on the way of some very high quality companies. So, you know, will these exact stocks continue to go up at this rate, or are there going to be new things that, that attract investors? Uh, I think it's more the latter. Okay, yeah. What do you think of the GWPH one? I just want to go to one because that's what you've said before. You think that might be best in breed here. It has pulled back here about 10 bucks or 12 bucks from the highs. It's up a little bit here this morning. But uh, what do you think of this chart? Or what do you think of GWPH here going forward, Alan? Well, so fundamentally, it's a great story. Valuation is really a hard call. That's, that's kind of right. the issue. Uh, but they are best in breed. And there's really uh, there's a few biotech companies I'm aware of. An, that's uh, another uh, reverse merger coming. Uh, in the next few months uh, that'll be interesting on that front but uh, the chart is really interesting I, I uh, this is one that you always want to buy it about 10 percent higher than you think you'd like to buy it and that seems to work so right now <laughs> I've been telling uh, the the subscribers of 420 investor that kind of a pullback to 60 65 would be real healthy and that's kind of the zone uh, where I see it pulling back to so that's where you're eyeing it up that's what I'm looking for it, it never seems to get to where I uh, expect it to get and if it does it's it's just there for a nanosecond yeah you have your bed out there waiting for it well you know it's funny uh, you probably see that spike down to 52 and I had been uh, at that time I was telling people 50 52 that's the zone and uh, there was a report that came out uh, ironically I, I mentioned that there was an article in Seeking Alpha that the initial one that caught my attention it was on a different stock but the same author it's a collective called Inficialis uh, really bad article uh, this time uh, said that, that GW was overpriced I don't even remember what the thesis was but that you know these 
I guess that that caused some profit taking, and we had some people that bought stock at 52 that day. So it is good to keep a trailing, especially on the penny stocks. But you know, GW obviously Nasdaq. But it's good to keep a bit under the market if you're looking to get into the market. I remember DJ was looking at it that day in the chat room, and I just can't remember if he got it or not. Well, you have to be fast on yeah, that one. Yeah, you do. You got to be fast and just close your eyes. But uh, you know, Alan, what I what I like when you talk about these stocks is that you know you talk about um, you know the credibility in the sector and. There's a lot of a lot of low price stocks, and there's a lot of um, uh, crazy trading activity going. And you're analyzing the market, I, I guess, from uh, both perspectives. Um, are you uh, are you playing any of this stuff uh, from the short side? Uh, when you know you feel that the you know just the ridiculous valuations, or are you just are you just so you know embedded on the buy side that you sit out these uh, ridiculous moves up and you don't don't short the market? Well, so. It, I think people laugh at me sometimes because I, I always say all these stocks seem overvalued, but you should buy them anyway. But uh, it's kind of—I'm sure it's kind of like the dot-com era. You know, you have to know where you are in the cycle. We don't at 420 Investor. We don't do any shorts. There's a, a new service that Markify just launched called the uh, Marijuana Stock Technical Trader. He's not doing shorts either. It's really hard to short penny stocks, uh, from what I understand. And uh, I, I just don't think that's a good use of time right now. I know a lot of guys are playing it that way it's just not my focus it's such a hard thing too because there's extra fees and people don't always consider all these extra fees the low k fees the hard to borrow because most of these stocks are probably not easy to borrow so there's a lot of other fees you got to consider when you're shorting the stocks here too so speculative plays are always scary to short because something can happen a news headline comes out the thing doubles on you well, that's you're, you're you're in serious trouble, obviously. Then, so I, th I think um, a, a better game right now is uh, I've noticed that you know people be focused on one stock. Uh, Terratech is a great uh, leader in the space. Uh, people love the CEO Derek Peterson, for instance, and that stock, the, the setup there. If you can pull what's the symbol, the symbol on that? Yeah, now? it's TRTC, and so we're, we're, this is really not a now thing. It's a just look what just happened kind of thing. Uh, there was a double top on that stock, the way I was looking at it. I'm not looking at the chart right now, but uh, uh, it was uh, the stock. You know, you would have thought maybe it could get a 50% pop when it broke. It more than doubled out of that uh, out of that double top. And so I think the thing is, is you when you see that happen, and if you happen to get that right, then you move out of that, and then you move into like Grow Life symbol P H O T. That thing had like a uh, I've never even seen this before, but a, a quintuple top. Five times it tried to get through 40 cents. It never was able to close. It got, it kept peaking above their PHOT, yep. and then all of a sudden we're off to the races. And so that's a leader in the space. And you know who knows where it's going to go. Uh, it's already up 50 percent out of that 40 cent uh, resistance. But if it follows the Terratech example, it could go up, you know, 100 percent or more from 40 cents. So that's 80 cents, maybe higher. What about uh, C A R A? Is that uh, is that in the space? It's kind of in the space. The CEO was actually interviewed, and he wanted to make sure people knew that that wasn't the primary driver, which I think is important to realize. But anything that smells like pot, uh, no no pun intended <laughs> on that one, people want. So uh, it, they do have uh, two patents in the space. One of which has been publicly disclosed, and the other one they haven't really talked about. But uh, you can do the research and find it. And it's. It's a neat little company. That's a NASDAQ biotech. And so people like NASDAQ. Obviously, you can uh, margin it. It's more liquid pre-market and after-market trading if you want to play it that way. So CAR is definitely one that's capturing people's attention. Not as much of a pot play as uh, GW. Um, also, what about that? F Go ahead, Dennis. I was just going to ask about that FULL stock again there, too, because this was one that you had said obviously had, I think, some warrants or something, or they had some rights to buy. Right. I think it was cannabis when you were on the show about yep. a month and a half ago. And you were talking about this one at like $7.40. And then after, you know, it's just taken off. I still so like it. Point. Yeah, the math here yeah. is compelling. So there's two pieces to it. They, This company uh, did a lot of research. It's a business development company in New York City. These, and, and that's what we're seeing happen, by the way. We're seeing smart money like these guys at Full uh, Circle uh, come into the market. They did their research. They picked the best in breed partner in Advanced Cannabis Solutions, symbol C-A-N-N. So the two parts to the equation are, number one, they have a million warrants at 550 a share. They paid 50 cents for those. That's a done deal. And you can look at where C-A-N-N is now. There's a ton of value just from that. Then they also have, as soon as uh, this is going to happen, it just hasn't happened yet, uh, 
uh, when they start to, to make their first seven and a half million dollars of, of loans to CANN to buy land, uh, they will get uh, a convertible note. It pays 12% interest, and it is convertible at five dollars a share. So that's another million and a half shares at five at five dollars. And so <laughs> CNN is trading in the 30s. Now I don't know that CNN is worth that. Maybe it is, but I don't. It's hard to say that it is right now. But uh, as soon as as soon as CNN comes out and announces that they're borrowing the money, it's a, it, it will be a done deal on that million and a half uh, shares through the converts. If you do that math, it's not necessarily going to trade at the full value, but you get above $14 a share of full value. I've been telling my subscribers it should get to at least $10, so we're on our way there. <laughs> okay. Um, are there many options out there on these stocks? I know The G only one's GW. I think CARA is coming. Uh, I think that's going to be... These things are already so volatile. I'm not sure you need options on. There are they are options, but uh, yeah, I the think any penny stock is an option. So, <laughs> you know, Alan. Also, I know you you approach the industry from uh, the perspective of the actual stocks, but um, and we're going to go more into this in in our interview uh, uh, later on today. But you know, what about some of the plays? You know, if this is going to become a you know a much bigger sector, um, obviously you know, to grow it and to manufacture it. I mean, there are going to be uh, companies that are going to benefit for that, from that. Um, I was taking a look at one, um, AWR, American Water. Uh, this thing has had a huge run, obviously, uh, using the hydroponics and whatnot. Uh, is that something? Are you just focusing on the stocks themselves? Or you know, are you I, looking I, maybe I've the missed point? that one, but uh, lighting, there's some lighting plays out there. Okay. Uh, I'm starting to look into them. It's It's... Yeah, that is a smart thing to do. I'm not seeing those plays. Uh, a lot of these companies, for whatever reason, they're not going to tell you that they're a cannabis play necessarily because they're conservative. They don't want to uh, risk anything. So that's a, not a bad idea to look into that. But I've, I've not identified AWR as being a play yet. Oh, okay. All right. So we were looking in, at stocks in that sector. Um, also, I mean, there's a lot going on with, uh, you know, Reynolds and Lorillard. I mean, how do you think these, you know, this, uh, this kind of action is going to affect the, uh, tobacco stocks? So they want in the space. I've heard, uh, behind the scenes that there, there's talks about making non-controlling equity investments so that they open the door so that when it is federally legal, they'll be able to make the acquisition. But we're talking about, uh, a passive investment. We're talking about into an unprofitable company price. So it's not really going to affect those companies. But uh, down the road, when you get federal legalization, which is probably 2020, maybe 2018, but that's probably the right time frame to think about it, then we'll see those companies come in very aggressively and uh, e either do their own new stuff or acquire existing stuff. Okay. Alan, I've just got to ask you before we leave because uh, I'm obviously where Detroit Windsor is right across the border here. And the buzz in the city of Windsor, Ontario about this FITX stock has been incredible in the last month and a half. Um, they're talking that there's a plant getting built over here. I've actually went and taken a drive over to the building. I've just seen this huge fence built around this building. It's a double fence. It's like 12 feet high. So I think this buzz might be true that they're actually going to start, you know, pro you know, uh, actually a production facility here for the pot. What are you hearing on the FITX? Is that like the Canadian way to play this? So there's a lot. First of all, Canada is a huge story. Anybody that, that wants to play uh, in the space should do some work. There's a lot of companies. FITX is like the Babe Ruth. They are swinging big. Uh, I'm going today to meet face-to-face uh, -face for the first time with Bill Shaban, the CEO, and also uh, Dr. Sam, uh, the, who's really the kind of the brains behind the, the whole project from what I gather. Uh, so I'll, I'll have more to say after that. But I think the issue here is it's very real. And my understanding is that they're doing things very smartly. Uh, but they're making some pretty bold claims. Uh, I'm unable to really sign off on what they're saying. If they, if what they're saying is 100% true, it's unbelievable. What I tell people is if it's even 25% true, it's really, really good. So I can see why there's a lot of excitement. Uh, it's a little, you know, it's a penny stock. There's some issues here. But uh, I'm, this is what I'm actually kind of excited about. Yeah, I guess they're getting a lot of support from Rob Ford. 
Yeah. Oh, come on. You gotta get the Rob. <laughs> yeah. You gotta get the was all decked out in his St. Paddy's gear there a day. I actually tweeted out he was all decked out in his St. Paddy's Day stuff last night. And I was like, and somebody tweets out, oh boy, we know how this ends. Right. <laughs> he's got all the green outfit on. He's got the bow tie. He's right ready to rock the big hat on. No, <laughs> FITX is nothing like that. I mean, the, the, the CEO there doesn't use cannabis. I mean, like a lot of people in the industry, this is. You know, they're, it's a bunch of lawyers, basically. Very uh, professional. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's it's it's a penny stock. Let's not go get overboard here. But I, I like <laughs> what Bill's doing, except you know, it rubs it rubbed me wrong, and it rubs a lot of people wrong that he, they went from being very quiet, which is okay, to being very loud, and that bothers people. It certainly uh, gets my antenna up when I see somebody on Facebook talking talking up their company and their stock. Which he does. Uh, I think I understand it. It's not my favorite thing. That's just one of the things you have to get your hands around. And it's, this is one of the most exciting stories in the space. Okay, so Alan is. Uh, I like the words of caution here, Alan, because these stocks are extremely volatile. Uh, discretionary investments and stuff you can make or lose a lot oh, of the money. The SEC just shut down two companies in the last few weeks. Yep. So. Uh, halted their stocks. I shouldn't say shut them down. Halted their stocks. Right, so um, this is just a sampling of what we're uh, some of the. I got a whole list of questions here for Alan. We're going to be asking him on that uh, that interview later. So, Alan, thanks for taking your time out this morning, and we'll get uh, we'll get back to you later on. Thank okay, you. thanks. Always great. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Joel, we got an Under Armour split just announced when we were on the call there with Alan. UA two for one stock split here. It is popping up on that news here, right here, right now. All right, well, why don't you give your overall uh, stock split uh, analysis here? Because I know with the, with the uh, AXP that that ended up working out beautifully. Wasn't it the day that— Oh, with the MasterCard, you mean? Yeah, yeah, MasterCard. Yeah, with the MasterCard split. Like, So what typically happens is after a stock—obviously on the announcement day of the stock split, they almost always pop. Uh, it's actually a pretty conservative pop here so far for UA. I think that high— Obviously, all-time high is kicking right here, right now, which we are approaching 119.97 and 11985. So we're just trading under. Obviously, the 120 area is defended. If this starts getting above 120, usually when you announce the stocks, but it's usually worth at least two to three percent, uh, depending on which company it is as well. But if they're smaller companies, sometimes they can even be worth more than that. And then a lot of times you'll see a drift up until the day that the stock actually goes, you know, post-split. And on the day of post split, a lot of times it will open up a little bit more that day and then typically tanks. Now, this is all statistics. So this isn't, you know, you've got to always live in the probability. So I'm just saying this is what typically happens. It's not going to necessarily happen in this case. So we don't know the date. This, this information obviously just announced here just seven, eight minutes ago here right now. So very new information. But right now we're seeing a $2 lift here in UA. One nineteen. Uh... The recent high of the move has been one nineteen ninety seven, and then boy, if you had your offers out, you're getting done right now because it just traded one nineteen eighty nine. Uh, it got kind of to back up near that one twenty, and then uh, uh, you know there was rumors that the reason we got shut out in metals was because of the Under Armour suits, and uh, they took that news down, and then you had some great consolidation. Uh, between 115 and uh, the higher end at 118. Now you're breaking out of that uh, to new all-time highs. Sure like to see it. If I'm playing this uh, for momentum, sure like to see it just uh, hold this 120 level uh, off the open and uh, continue north. Hey, Dennis, just from that press release, the added shares will be distributed on April 14th with a record holder date of March 28th. Okay, so there you go. So we're looking at April 14th as the, so not the too far away here, actually. So you got about three weeks or so, three and a half weeks here of potential uh, and, and run up. And obviously, you've got to always keep the overall market. So you have now two things going to be at, pay, at play, people buying the stock ahead of, to get this, obviously, the extra shares and the two for one, but then the overall market and as stuff moves there, too. So consider all that when you're trading this. But from a statistical standpoint, these things tend to be strong prior to the split and week afterwards. Right. Uh, my MasterCard chart is not adjusted, but uh, what happened was is that you did have 
the gap up, the run after, and then it came down on the uh, IPO date, uh, was over 80, and then it, boy, came all the way down. I mean, some of that had to do, you know, market-related when you had to sell off in February. Uh, now it's battling its way back up, but, boy, there's major resistance um, in uh, MasterCard if you get back up into those higher 78s. Just before we end the show quickly, let's look at a few upgrades and downgrades okay. of note here. I know Brent will get into them in detail just after our second interview. But uh, I just want to talk about Facebook because we do have a downgrade Ooh. in Facebook here today. When do you see it? You never see a downgrade in Facebook. Argus is downgrading the stock here. It's actually still trading up here on the day. Brent, do you have the note from Argus here? Because this is interesting when you get a downgrade of Facebook. Uh, let me see if I can dig up some comments. Just give me just one second. Yeah, we'll give Brent a second here. Joel, do the technicals on this thing. Obviously, the stock has been weak the last couple of days with the overall market here. You would think it would have a nice pop here today, but the downgrade is holding it back. I was able to squeeze a few shekels, as uh, Fari would say, out of this one. Uh, yeah? Yeah. With what'd, the, you, what'd you play? Uh, I played the, the weekly 70 puts last week. And, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, and uh, got in a little bit early, gained a little confidence when it made that uh, that double bottom at uh, at 70, or double top at 71.35. Uh, I was in uh, well ahead of that level. Uh, but what I did was this one is I just basically, you know, instead of, like, trying to actually pick a stock price, I just went for a double on my options. And I just said, okay, when, the, you know, I bought them, I, I bought I paid up for them. I, I bought them at, uh, at 80 cents, and... Uh, Boy, on one day I had an opportunity to double them uh, at a buck sixty, and I just said, "See ya." They ended up going off the board at like two eighteen, you know, uh, you know, little bit at two twenty eight. So I left some on the table, but man, oh man, oh man, it's just you know, too much volatility really going against the trend here. Uh, sixty seven forty six is uh, the low from Friday. Uh, that coincides with another low that you had in the issue at sixty seven sixty two. So. I don't know. Wouldn't be paying much attention to this until it took out to 67.50. So the Argus analysts, a bit of a valuation call here. I mean, we are up 25, 30% over the last month and a half or so. Looks like the Argus analysts saying he's not too attracted by the fact that Facebook is facing, uh, excuse me, focusing on the long term. He wants kind of some immediate monetization of the existing services that they have. One of the points there, Facebook is looking to build WhatsApp base to over a billion users and not necessarily looking at monetizing some of those premium services that WhatsApp has. So that was uh, some comments from the Argus analyst. Thanks there, Brent. Also, Brent, do you have the, there was a Lorillard LO, which we just talked about with Alan there. Um, it was upgraded at Goldman Sachs here today, and I'm interested in this one. I'm actually long this stock in my own investment portfolio. Obviously, uh -huh. it was rumors there. Two weeks ago when Joel was away that Reynolds was sniffing around and might pay over 60 bucks for the stock. Those rumors didn't come to fruition here, at least not yet, and the stock has pulled back significantly off of those highs, but it's kind of find a nice little home, little triple bottom here in the 50, 80 area. Now with the Goldman Sachs upgrade, the stock is popping a dollar twenty here this morning. Uh, what was Goldman saying on that report? L O. Let's see. I can I can read you a little bit here from the note. It says uh, Goldman says we see 20. 20% plus total return potential in Lorillard in the 12 months based on our scenario based some of the parts and M&A driven price target methodology. We see high visible double digit EPS growth outlook, a window of relatively, relatively benign menthol regulation risk and compelling cash. Concurrently we are lowering our rating as the stock is now within 6% of our updated price target. So for all that, looks like a valuation call. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So valuation. Did they get a price target on it? Um. Yeah, they did up their price target from eighty-four bucks to eighty-eight bucks. On LO, they're saying eighty-eight bucks. Uh. Is that right? It's a fifty. Oh, excuse stock. me. Sorry, that was that was the that was consolation. Holy cow. That was a okay. totally different one. I scared you, didn't I? Dennis? Okay, go to LO now, Brent. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I was like, uh, I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, he, he said uh, he's close uh, to Alan. So you were talking STZ, bro. So strike the record. <laughs> yeah, that was all it's... for Constellation Brands. 
Al O. What do you got Goldman saying for Let's Al O? Let's see. <laughs> um, actually, I think I read you some of it. They say it's it's got a sixty dollar price target. Okay, sixty dollar uh, price. Yeah. All right, I got to break in here. Uh, we got uh, Victor Riccardi coming in. He is uh, an associate professor for financial management at Goucher College, and he is co-editor of a book with Kent Baker on investor behavior, the psychology of financial planning and investing. And we know we have a lot of psychos on this show, so uh, this, yeah, this so this should be a good interview. We'll be right back with Victor. Welcome back, traders and investors. We have Victor Riccardi here. He is a co-editor of a book with uh, Ken Baker on investor behavior, the psychology of financial planning and investing available on Amazon. Hi, should, should I call you Victor or should I call you Professor? Uh, Victor is fine. I'm very humble. Uh, okay, Victor. Good morning to you. Um, so before we get into the book, uh, just give us your definition of behavioral finance. Uh, behavioral finance is just um, taking the many aspects of psychology and applying them to uh, finance, um, but also taking an alternative view of the traditional or expanded finance school that's based on rationality, uh, behavioral finance is based on that people make decisions based on bounded rationality, that we're influenced by our emotions, our uh, cognitive uh, processes, things such as heuristics, where we use certain rules of thumb. So it's not that we're very crazy necessarily, but we, we don't always optimize. We sometimes base decisions based on our satisfactory outcomes. Okay, I think you kind of touched on it here a little bit, but uh, just give us uh, a couple of the basic themes of behavioral finance. Um, a couple, and uh, try to even things that apply to traders, but also investors. Uh, people tend to be loss averse, meaning we tend not to, to like to take losses. So, for example, a thousand dollar gain on the upside it is an equivalent to a two thousand dollar loss on the downside. So, for example, a loss feels twice as painful as an equivalent gain, and that's noted by, say, something like the, the, the disposition effect, in which people uh, tend to uh, sell winners on the upside too early, and we uh, tend to hold on to dogs or losing stocks uh, too, too long. Um, another major aspect is people tend to be overconfident in which they trade too much and that eats away into their trading losses. Those are two major findings of behavioral finance. Okay, Dennis is Dennis is happy here in the chat room because he talks about loss aversion all the time. And that's how, you know, when stocks get away from people that, hey, it's going to come back. It's going to come back. And I think that what, uh, you know, when you go into this loss aversion, it kind of plays into the hands of our, you know, the technicians, uh, you know, like us, Dennis and I, and a lot of people on their show because, 
you do see where the herd from the charts gets, you know, gets caught up in stocks. And a lot of times you can identify those levels because they're, you know, when it comes back to that, you know, like how many people are, you know, waiting for, you know, that bought GM recently, waiting for it to get back to $40. Well, I'm not going to sell it now at a loss. I'm going to wait to get back to 40 Um, Also, another aspect uh, that Dennis talks a lot about, and we've written several articles. Uh, I don't know if this is part of your thesis or not, but the herd mentality. Mentality. Oh well, yeah, definitely the herd or the group psychology. But just one one reference to what is combined with loss aversion discussed in the book is something known as an anchoring effect, in which we have a reference point, and that's a central piece of what's known as um, loss aversion, but what's also related to what's known as prospect theory, and where we focus on that past trade. So if that uh, that last trade was positive. We tend to go the upside, but also if that last trade was negative, we don't want to we don't want to lose. We don't want to realize the loss, but also people or traders especially tend to double down on the loss when they probably should sell the stock. Um, herd behavior is another issue in which uh, people view, especially in times of a bubble or a, a bubble in asset category, in which people uh, then follow the herd and. You know, it's fine if you're early, if you got in early and you get out early, but the problem is if you're the person or the trader that follows the herd and you're the, and once, once the bubble pops, you're left with a losing position because you, instead of buying uh, low and selling high, uh, the herd behavior many times leads to you buying high and selling low. Okay, so a couple of your books actually just focus on on traders' uh, psychology, and we got a lot of traders here that listen to our show. Uh, could you just just talk about one or two chapters from the book uh, uh, that focus specifically on trader psychology? Um, well, one looks at uh, chapter looks at trading and investor psychology, so it breaks um, breaks the trading uh, strategy into short term and long term. Issues. So, sh- examples of short-term trading issues would be things uh, like momentum. So, there's definitely uh, momentum in stock prices, and people can make money that way. Uh, another piece of it that's very a short-term strategy would be looking at the um, hedge fund reports, in which you see um, what positions hedge funds uh, are taking. Uh, long-term strategies would be looking at things such as contrarian views and how you definitely make money going against the crowd. So rather than always following the herd, you sometimes take that uh, contrarian view. Um, another major aspect of trading um, uh, strategy in the book is also looking at earnings surprises. So you're making the assumption that the stock prices do not always react uh, quickly, so you're going against the efficient market hypothesis with that type of trading strategy. Um, so that's more on the, the macro side. The other chapter, a couple chapters, look at the individual trader and how they make mistakes based on those behavioral issues, such as personality, overconfidence, um, so something like the hot hand fallacy, in which you assume that, you know, for example, in baseball or basketball, the next hit is you look at the probability that's going to increase, and so you put the, you think the statistical odds are going to increase. So then you take that same fallacy towards uh, stock investing, in which you, if you made money from the last trade, you think you're more likely to make more money, or the same, or your next trade is more likely to be on the upside, making money from it. Okay, the whole psychology. So uh, obviously, to, in order to write this book along with Kent, I mean, you had uh, you had to get a lot of uh, uh, data, right? You had to get a lot of information. How how did you go about that? Did you interview traders, or did you have uh, uh, just read other books on it? Or really, you know, because you're you're really talking about uh, some information here. Did you observe trading rooms, or how did you come up with this information? Uh, what's, re- what's nice about it is we, Kent and I recruited 45 experts to write 30 chapters. And so th- they've all, you know, so for example, three or four of the chapters deal with people who are trading coaches. Uh, we have a couple of experts who actually have um, studied uh, through trading floors the actual people. So what, what's nice is many times it's, it's hard to, uh, for one person to write a book 
and and have all this expertise. So rather than us try to be experts in everything, we went to the experts who are some are academics, but also some are actually people who are traders. Other people are uh, people who provide coaching to traders and investing. So it give, so they they take out many of the equations and they pr- provide the research of what they, they've experienced, but also in terms of best practices, but also they provide a nice summary of, of much of the research going on. And then Kent and I probably spent about a thousand hours editing all these people's work over the last three years. Wow. And who, who are some of the uh, trading coaches that, uh, that are in the book? Uh, Denise Scholl, she's been on CNBC a number of times. So she's really the primary expert, and then she has two colleagues who provide a, a trading a coach advice and their own businesses. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Jay, Jay Peter, uh, or Julia Peters, uh-huh. she, she wrote a chapter. Uh, she's more an academic, but she's also starting her own firm currently based on trading psychology. So, so there's a number of uh, astute people um, uh, there's just so, so many uh, contributors uh, that that I think w- would be helpful. Who again are academics and not academics. Um, and uh, and what about uh, what about actual traders that are in the book? Um, I would get why well, I, I guess not actual traders, but I guess um, portfolio managers who 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 actually manage money from a behavioral perspective. I think um, one person's name is uh, John L- Lungo. Mm-hmm. For example, so that gives you just a, a sampling. Uh, I, I would say probably about two thirds of the individuals are academics. Okay. Probably about one third are investment professionals, and so it's it was it was I found it more difficult to find we found it more difficult to find people who were not academics sometimes to write chapters in the book. Okay, and so you've compiled all this in, uh, information on, on uh, trader psychology and behavior, and uh, you know you've experienced the markets here. Is it has it helped you with your own personal investing? Um, yes, it has. So it's it taught me that I shouldn't be a trader. So I'm probably the opposite. <laughs> I've learned to be a long term a long term investor. So I I look. I take the position that I agree with modern portfolio theory and their tools. I just disagree with the underlying assumptions. Uh, so I tend to be a long-term trader, a long-term investor, but then I have about um, I have money that I have learned just to use my IRA account. And if I'm going to buy an individual stock, I take about 10% of my own portfolio, and I just use that money. And then I take a long-term perspective with the other 90%. And also the, the key thing I've learned is to balance between my overconfidence and my status quo bias. So the, the thing I found as, as far as being a long-term investor is to rebalance. And I think even we, we have a study in the book that shows about 80% of people don't even rebalance their portfolios in terms of the retirement funds, for example. Right, and just uh, as far as di- using the different asset classes, that that's an important point. But okay, well, just also you know, just from your studies here of you know the behavioral finance, obviously, uh, how long have you been working? How how long did it take you to produce this book? Well, I was introduced to behavioral finance as part of my graduate work uh, fifteen years ago. Um, in terms of knowledge, it's probably taken ten years worth of knowledge to be able to handle doing this type of book, so, but we started working on this project about two and a half years ago. So it, it, it um, definitely was a, a major, major undertaking, and I'm so happy that it's finally <laughs> uh, it. uh, it's available to buy it now on Amazon. So it's, it's certainly worth the pu- uh, purchase, I think, the amount of hours that went into it. I think people will, provide, I think it will, people will get a lot from this book. Okay, and uh, just to close out the interview here, I mean, with this market, especially in the time that you've been uh, been writing your book and stuff, the market has just been behaving perfect, right, for investors? I guess for a majority of issues, we've had a, a great run up in the market. Uh, do, you, do you get any cues from, you know, trading, you know, from studying the psychology of traders and hedge fund managers and stuff? I mean, is, are we at a... a 
and we just in a euphoric state here is the market just just going to keep going higher forever or is there something that you're seeing in the behavior of the market that that makes you a little bit skeptical well i i i mean i don't i mean people are acting like these valuations are very um historically above average and i don't view it that way because i i use a reference point to the internet mania in which the the nasdaq had reached 5000 and if you take the high value of money i, I still think the market is not necessarily reasonably overpriced, but I don't think it's um, the bubble. That's, that, that if you look at comparable bubbles that were a part of the financial crisis five years ago, and if you look at the bubble late 90s, I still don't view us in, in too much of a bubble necessarily right now. So I still think we have some time for some upside. Okay. All right. We've had um, Victor Riccardi here, who's our co edited a book with uh, Kent Baker, uh, Kent Baker Investor Behavior, The Psychology of Financial Planning and Investing, available on Amazon, uh, studying trader psychology from several different perspectives. I'll definitely take a look at that book, Victor. Thank you very much for coming on, and uh, it's great to, great to have you on as a guest. Oh, great. Uh, and you can, people can follow me on Twitter at my uh, Victor Riccardi, my full name, or they can just search... Uh, Twitter by Behavioral Finance, and my name will come up. Okay. Thank you, Victor. Great. Thanks for having me. Okay. All right. Now we are going to go with to, I'll call him Mighty Joe Young now, because uh, he he's been real nice to me so far today. So Mighty Joe Young, you ready with the morning headlines? It's amazing what a good night's sleep will do for you, Joel. Ah, oh, actually, I had my first night's sleep in a genuine Tempur-Pedic mattress this weekend, and I highly recommend the experience to anyone should you get the chance. So that's an upgrade, then. Uh, yes, I would say so. I would say so. So let's move on to today's special St. Paddy's Day edition of the headlines from around the globe. The U.S. and its allies in Europe are expected to announce sanctions against Russia, including visa bans and potential asset freezes on Monday, one day after Crimea's Crimea, Crimea River, right, Jake? Crimea's vote to secede, not succeed, from Ukraine and join Russia. President Barack Obama told Russian Pres President Vladimir Putin on Sunday that Crimea's vote would never be recognized by the United States as he and other top U.S. officials warned Moscow against taking further military moves towards southern and eastern Ukraine. The two leaders spoke after residents in Crimea voted overwhelmingly in favor of the split in a referendum that the United States, the European, e European Union, and others say violates the Ukrainian constitution and international law and took place in the strategic peninsula under duress of Russian military intervention. Putin maintained that the vote was legal and consistent with the right of self-determination, according to the Kremlin. But the White House said Obama reminded Putin that the U.S. and its allies in Europe would impose sanctions against Russia should it annex. Crimea. Crimea's parliament on Monday declared the region an independent state and said that all Ukrainian state property on the territory of the Black Sea Peninsula will be nationalized. The search for the missing, missing Malaysian jet pushed deep into the northern and southern hemispheres Monday as Australia took the lead in scouring the seas of the southern Indian Ocean and Kazakhstan, about 10,000 miles to the northwest, answered Malaysia's call for help in the unprecedented hunt. French investigators arrived to lend expertise from the two-year search in, for an Air France jet that crashed into the Atlantic Ocean in 2009, said they were able to rely on distress signals. But investigators say the Malaysian airliner's communications links were deliberately severed ahead of its mysterious disappearance more than a week ago. By the end of February, the average tax refund handed out was $3,034, the Internal Revenue Service said on Thursday. That's up 3% compared with the same period a year ago. Americans seem more eager than ever to get their paperwork done for the year. More than 48 million refunds had been issued by February 28th, up 5.6% from the same time last year, the tax agency said. About 80% of those refunds have been direct deposits to taxpayer bank accounts instead of paper checks. The IRS said it had received nearly 40% of all the tax returns expected this season. More than 57 million individual tax returns have been processed, up nearly 11% from last year. And Vodafone, the world's second largest wireless carrier, agreed to buy Spanish cable operator Grupo Corpa Corporativo Ono for 7.2 billion euros or about 10 billion US dollars, including debt, to boost TV and broadband offerings. 
The purchase gives Vodafone 1.9 million customers in Spain, complementing its mobile service and helping it challenge Telefonica SA and Orange SA. The deal will generate savings of about 2 billion euros and potential revenue addition of 1 billion euros, Newbury, England-based Vodafone said today. Vodafone, which bought Germany's cable Deutschland holding AG last year, is adding landline services to compensate for declining wireless revenue. The deal is part of Vodafone's strategy to build a Europe-wide operation to seek growth and savings, said Robin Bienenstock, a San Francisco Bernstein analyst. Bialystock, I think it was supposed to be the name there, but um, I guess not. Twitter CEO Dick Costolo will meet Shanghai government officials, academics, and students in his first visit to China, signaling Twitter's interest in cracking a lucrative but thorny market with 600 million internet users. Twitter, which has been blocked by Chinese censors since 2009, described the trip as a personal tour for Costolo, who is due to land Shanghai's Pudong International Airport on Monday and plans to spend three days in the business capital. He is not scheduled to visit Beijing. California man exercised good judgment by turning himself in after Googling his name and finding himself on a most wanted website, according to authorities. A bout of curiosity, followed by guilt, landed Christopher Viatafa in jail last week for a gun-related incident allegedly committed more than seven months ago, police said. Viatafa was wanted by police in connection with an August 2013 incident involving shooting into an inhabited dwelling, but the 27-year-old had no idea his mugshot was featured on Northern California's Most Wanted website until he looked himself up on the Internet. When he found out, he was alarmed enough to turn himself into authorities, according to police. And Irish brewer Guinness said on Sunday that it would not participate in New York City's St. Patrick's Day Parade this year because gay and lesbian groups had been excluded, costing organizers a key sponsor of the annual event. The move came on the same day that Boston Irish American mayor skipped that city's St. Patrick's Day Parade after failing to hammer out a deal with organizers to allow a group of gay and lesbian activists to march openly. And today's trivia tidbit, former Seinfeld star Wayne Knight is apparently the latest victim of an internet death hoax. According to The Hollywood Reporter, pranksters launched parody TMZ and Us Weekly sites claiming Knight had been killed and two passengers injured after the vehicle slammed into a disabled semi-tractor trailer on late Sunday, uh, late Sunday night along Route 446 near the Pennsylvania-New York border in Eldred Township. The 58-year-old actor, best known for his role as Newman on Seinfeld, immediately squashed the reports, tweeting Sunday, Some of you will be glad to hear this. Others strangely disappointed. But... I am alive and well. That wraps it up for today's editorial headlines. Just a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, on this St. Patrick's Day, that the show would not be possible without our dear friends at Options House. No, we didn't decorate the page green and orange just because of the holiday. Those are Options House's colors. So just click on one of those green and orange buttons, open an Options House account, get plenty of green from your free 150 commission-free trades just because you listen to Benzinga's pre-market prep. I'm looking around the rest of the snooze desk here to find my main man Brent wearing his green green stripes in honor of the holiday today. Brent, what's going on, man? I got two layers of green stripes, actually. He's got two layers. Well, good. Then um, I vote that one of those layers be devoted in honor of me because I forgot to wear green this All morning right. to work. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Yep, but poor Kurt. Um, I promised I wouldn't pinch him, but other people can. So, Joel, feel free. Pinch Kurt. He's not wearing any green. Uh, no, oh, that's I, what I, you do? I, well, yeah, yeah actually, I, I, I was thinking about that this morning because just somehow I forgot to wear green as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, re- not really into Jake, uh, it, it college just, basketball like, Just to talk about not overconfidence in the game, my, my daughter, who is a freshman at Michigan State, called me before the game. Wanted to get some green out of me and bet on the game, and she was offering <laughs> me substantial amount of points above the spread, and I said no. I said no. So no. wait, your daughter called you to ask for money to bet on the game? No, she wanted to bet me on the game. Oh, 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 yeah, oh I got gotcha. you. She wanted gotcha. to get some green out of him. Yeah, she wanted to get some green out of me, and I said no, Emily. I can, I can identify a. Uh, you know, actually, I wish I could bet against Michigan. If I could bet against Michigan, man, I would. It, 
Well, no, just overall, you know, overall, because they break my heart so many times. I so. know, but you're a, you're a house divided, right, Joel? Do you have one of those split Michigan, Michigan State flags <laughs> out front? I like too? those. You see my split shirt, right, that the girls got me? Yep, yep, yep. Saw, uh, yeah. But no, no. But fl- if I recall correctly, your house has green shutters on oh, it, I right? I know, and I'm so still, I, it's don't still. Don't remind them. Uh, yeah. Basically, oh, did it's you just have to upset a, me? State represent, a Michigan State representation on the front of your house for all of your neighbors. It's just because it's Lisa. I mean, you know, Lisa went to state for a year. Uh-huh. My dad, my dad, rest in peace, doesn't know that. So uh, wait, isn't Lisa's car green too? No, come on, let's go to Brad. The Tigo, enough. the Tigo was green. Also, let's just go to Brad. Brad, I what think, do you got? I think your blood, or your blood is green. You're green with envy. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> we shall see what happens. Let me talk about a couple of the top upgrades and downgrades here this morning. We do have. Let's see. Let me pick out a good one. Just, just want to go make over sure a you couple read the, here. Make sure you huh. read the right report. Uh, yeah, like if it's an upgrade. It's usually important. If, yeah. An upgrade, I want them to talk about the stock going up. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I can't guarantee that the analysts are going to talk about that. One that I am watching this morning is an upgrade from Citigroup over uh, on shares of Regeneron, Romeo Echo Golf November. They upgraded the stock from neutral to buy. Regeneron, one of those... Uh, Pharma sort of momentum plays. It hasn't been too momentous as of late. Um, but take a look at that one real quick, Joel. Regeneron, R-E-G-N. That, you got it. Okay. Let's just take a look at this issue. Uh, this is in that high-flying sector then, correct? I mean, it's a huge company, so it's not exactly a traditional mo- Momo play. But if you look at the chart, you know it what? has I, been off to the races over yeah. the last few years here. What happened was that it had that one bad day that it snuck under 310. Uh, but besides that, uh, I like the support here at the 324, 325 level. I mean, that's the way I'd be playing it, you know, from the long side, expecting uh, to hold that uh, that major support there. Uh, trading up 450 in the pre-market. Did trade up the 338. We'll keep that eye as a potential resistance point. Uh, your two-day high at 342.56. Uh, that coincides with the net the 43.50 high. So hard to pick a top, but I definitely would see a point where I'd want to cut out on this stock. Uh, you know, under 324 and a half, 325. Fair enough. So we do have two upgrades on shares of Siemens this morning. It is an ADR though, Joe. So I'm not sure if you're gonna like this call or not, but both Bank of America and J.P. Morgan upgrading shares of Siemens this morning. Ticker is just SI. SI. And yeah. They're, they're kind of like a... Uh, Not sure how that's going to work on your, your charting there. On InfoLess Rider here? Yeah, InfoLess Rider. Uh, it's actually... This is the kind of a defense company, right? Or they do a lot of things, right? Defense, technology, things like that? Yeah, they're a huge conglomerate. Defense being one of their sections, yes. Wow, what a what a chart this is. Uh, kind of like a yo-yo thing here. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's getting a big boost on this upgrade here. 129.86, just kind of consolidating here. I'd look at this $130 level if you absolutely have to trade this thing. High at 130.32. We've hit 129.86 in the pre-market. I look at that. That's a big pop. The stock was under 124, hit 123.05 last Thursday. Getting a lot back at this. Uh, you know, if I was trading this ADI, I'd be looking at the 130 as a potential exit or a potential short. One more on the upgrade side of things, and I'll jump over to one downgrade. We do have a call from Cowan on some of the fertilizer stocks, upgrading shares of potash from underperform to market perform this morning. Also, I'll, I'll just let you start on, on potash. Potash. But, but they did also upgrade shares of Agrium and Rentech Nitrogen, which is ticker RNF. Okay. So let's take uh, a look at Potash real quick. We had that. Who was that young lady that we had on a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the fridge? She was really smart. She was talking about uh, the fertilizing and the e- ecological stocks. Oh, yeah. Remember that her? was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember what her name was, but that was kind of a cool little skit that we did. Yep. Uh, this stock has recovered uh, quite a bit here mm-hmm. from the $30 level, snuck over 35.50 up to. 3530 uh getting a little bit of a pullback here but you are getting nice support here uh just under the $34 level trading up in the pre-market. I kind of like this chart. I like to see it, you know, hold up, hold 34. 
Uh, we are trading right at Thursday's high, 34.39. We've snuck above that in the pre-market. So certainly like to see that hold that level and uh, itch up closer to the resistance at uh, the $35 level. All right, one more for you. Shares of Facebook did did, a get, did yeah. get a downgrade this morning. Argus Research downgrading from buy to hold this morning. Foxtrot Bravo is the ticker on Facebook. Uh, Facebook here, they're not really paying much attention to this uh, downgrade here. Uh, it's actually trading up on the downgrade, so uh, there you go. Uh, boom, let's see. We made a pre-market high, 68.80. Kind of finding support at 68, popping up. Uh, I'm looking at this 67.50 level. If it holds above there, I think you can perhaps uh, rally back up. Under 67.50, uh, got some room on the downside. And what is it? Ding, 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 ding. Ding, ding, ding. ding. And we're open for business here. S&P's 500s. Right up at the top of the range here, alert our traders, 45.75, pre-market high, Thursday's high, 46.25. We are at resistance, have already had a huge range here, so if you're looking for some follow-through here, you better get above uh, 18.46 in a hurry. Joel, take a look at the Tesla chart okay. just after the open. Looks like we were trying to hold above 235, but getting a pop this morning. A Baird analyst did raise the price target on shares of Tesla this morning. Let me pull that up real quick. Got to go find it. Raised it from 245 to 275. That Baird analyst said that there is a quote blue sky blue sky valuation of three hundred and fifty dollars per oh. share based on twenty twenty estimates for Tesla's auto and grid sales. Really? Wow. That's uh pretty uh I, I've never seen that term blue sky valuation before, but that is uh that's what that's what was in the note and that's what the, the sources are, are citing this morning. Ah, uh, well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get it off this support here, this uh, very important support. Uh, hit 228.32 on Friday. That coincides with the low you had at 228.45. So they are trying to get it away from that uh, that support level here. As uh, long as it holds there, it could perhaps drift back up. I do see that... Uh, 236.12 is the high in the session. 36.94 was your high on Friday. So get above the 237 level and uh, think you can get some more room on the upside. It's critical for Tesla to hold uh, this 228.32 level. Friday's low, and that was also the low on the 25th at 28.45 here. Uh, taking a look at uh, other things that are moving here. Uh, the Barron's bounce is coming through for shares of General Motors here. Opened up uh, near its low of the day so far. 34.14 open, 08 low. Uh, you've got to pop up to the 34.50 level. 44, 34.45 is a high. Just want to alert our traders. 34.56 was the high on Friday. Look out for some potential size at 34.50 uh, in General Motors. Uh, we got Shaky Jake here uh, in the house uh, for his um, analysis. Jake, how you doing this morning? I'm doing pretty great. Doing pretty great. Feeling uh, feeling chipper with the uh, the seeding of the tournament. I mean, we didn't get seeded perfectly, but we did get the I think second easiest bracket. I guess what's the one on the uh, the top right? Uh, is it, it's not, the Midwest and the South are brutal. Is it the North? Is what they're calling that? You or? know what? They're all brutal. I mean, you know, at, yeah. at the, the first weekend, you know, this uh, Sweet 16, but no matter what bracket, you know, I mean, you're going to run into a Duke or you're going to run into a Kentucky and yeah. you're going to run into a Louisville and they all happen to be in Michigan. Bracket, <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's a fun. I'll I tell you, it's uh, March Madness is just, it, it's the best, man. It there, is the best time of year, just period. Thursday it's, it's and Friday. Office is going to be open on Thursday and Friday. Uh, I think it will, but fortunately we've got enough screens here. I think we can watch all the games at once simultaneously, and uh, it'd be it'd be perfect. We can uh, run some uh, live news desk analysis on the games, and uh, it'll, be, it'll be great. We can drop that in in the news feed. Uh, I'm sure the traders are going to love that. Right. <laughs> okay. What do we got on the radar to here? Well, I think I'm going to get started with some of the solar names this morning. We did have um, 
uh, uh, JA Solar reporting an earnings beat this morning. Um, well, I guess not necessarily an earnings beat because uh, no analysts are specifically covering it, so we don't have an analyst consensus. But the di company did beat on revenues, so uh, that that did help there. So that's dragging up a lot of the North American solar names. So we've got names like uh, Canadian Solar showing strength, while well, First Solar and Solar City are as well. So uh, JA Solar, it's J so uh, Julia Alpha Sandy Oscar. Huge rally this morning. It was up uh, last time I checked, over, almost 15%. Uh, and we had those other names up about 3%. So uh, they're definitely getting a little bit of a uh, uh, relief, or not relief rally, but a uh, sympathy move on that. Yeah, well, uh, JASO, JA Solar Holdings, big pop in the pre market over the $14 level. Uh, people are using this opportunity so far, open much below that. Uh, 1282 open. Hit 1287 right off the bat, making another run at that high here. So seems like to be selling into this rally as of late. Uh, you did have a high also at 1280 back in November 14. So sure like to see some uh, some fall through through that 1280 level. Uh, perhaps uh, test some size at 13 there. Another one we've had we have really moving this morning is Hertz. Did you guys dive into this one yet? Uh, there's a report on uh, Financial Times uh, Friday at 10:20 p.m. So this is you know way after anyone's you know watching the markets closely, and it, it was really getting a boost uh, in the early pre-market. Basically, they're saying that they're close to a 4.3 billion dollar spin-off of its uh, equipment rentals business. Uh, and you know, there's been the rumor that Carl Icahn was in the name that he was pushing right. for this because there's there was the activist investor that was going for it that, that hadn't been identified. Now Carl said he was not in the name. But I don't think people really believe him. <laughs> uh, so I think a lot of a lot of traders are still thinking that maybe you know Uncle Carl's in it somehow. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's kind of an interesting uh, interesting move here. Uh, definitely going to be returning some capital to shareholders if this does go through, which whoever the activist shareholder is uh, is probably pretty happy about. You know what I think about every time I hear someone mention this stock. Hmm. Uh, my uh, brother-in-law, when my girls were little, would go up to him and say, "Have you ever had a Hertz donut?" Oh man, the classic. <laughs> yeah. Hertz donut. You ever oh, had? Man. And then he say no, and then he punches him in the arm and he goes, "Hertz donut." Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's uh. Yep. That's... I remember first grade as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. D can't blame that one on me. You can uh, blame that on um, Uncle Larry. That's Uncle Larry. There you so. go. Uh, but that stock did open up into uh, some major resistance here. Uh, did sneak over 28 uh, just off the off in 28.01. But uh, anybody that has a chart can see the two highs at 27.96 and 27.98. So ran into some problems on that gap up there. Looks like we're filling back in here um, as we speak. Uh, if you can finally get above that 26 or excuse me 28 dollar level. Yeah, we're running into more resistance at 28.37, which was the high on March 5th. Well, another one, I, I feel like uh, now that we're not going to be getting headlines every morning about uh, Joseph A. Banks and, uh, oh. and Men's Warehouse arguing with each other about who's going to buy who, we might as well get to the other story that's uh, just been beaten into the ground, which is the Yahoo Alibaba oh, IPO. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the other story that I feel like we hear about, you know, rough a couple times a week. Uh Latest rumors, they're going to be going for the New York Stock Exchange over Hong Kong. I guess Financial Times reporting it would be a 95% a uh, th uh, sure thing or whatever. Uh, so I guess they, they really hit it out of the park this weekend with a couple big reports. Um, but, I mean, once again, with Yahoo's gigantic stake in Alibaba, they're getting you know a nice little pop on almost 3.5% heading towards 40 bucks, which I know has been you know a pretty important psychological number. Uh, if if not necessarily for the technicals, but Joel, do you have any thoughts on Yahoo with this current? Yeah, move? actually, who was it was either GGB or J Dot or somebody last week was looking for this thing to go back to forty, and uh, at the time it just didn't have a good technical base to rally off. It did do that at the end of last week, as you made uh, two lows within three cents at thirty six forty five and thirty six uh, forty eight. So you got the base, you rallied, broke above the double top here. And now you get the gap up, you get the higher open, sneak over 39, but uh, it's not quite holding yet. So I'd see what happens here in the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes. See if it just, you know, get back above 39, 
hold it, you know, take out that high at 39 and a quarter because if you do, things really open up to 40, but it just seems like there's a little bit of a short-term profit taking here. The stock was just under 37 on Friday here at 39, kind of a big move for the issue. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, take it as it goes here, but sure like to see it get above 39 and a quarter here pretty quickly. Absolutely. So, uh, did you see what the uh, the cover story in Barron's was this weekend? Oh yeah, Detroit yeah. comeback. Yeah, the Motor City comeback. Yeah. yeah, I was glad to see that. I mean, uh, talked about a lot of things that's going on, but uh, you know, Danny Gilbert's just pouring money into the city. And what I what the thing that struck me in the article is that um, he was bidding on some properties, and he didn't get them. Some Chinese developers came in and now bent them. And at first he was bummed about it, mm -hmm. but then he was like, "Yeah, I got competition. You know, people are joining me, and I, I, I think that that, you know, that that kind of points out that there's you know other competition, people coming in, and s besides someone from the actual city, you know, putting all the money into it, yeah, attracting, uh, yeah, getting some, some capital from the outside. I know there's a big story. I, I can't remember. Was it CNBC that did the piece? But there's a, a lot of Chinese investors that are buying up homes, not necessarily commercial properties, but they're buying as many homes as they can because, uh, you know, the, the Chinese investors specifically look for real estate because they can't uh, legally buy, uh, um, you know, stocks in China. So they usually go for real estate investments. But in China, real estate, you know, is such a huge bubble over there. They want to, you know, diversify. And with, uh, you know, Detroit being as depressed as it is in the headlines, whether or not, you know, the headlines exactly match the city or not, um, you know, they're they're all kind of running over here. So uh, good to hear that maybe on the commercial side, then that's uh, that's going down. So definitely thought that was interesting. Um, looking at some of these other names, and we did have the news uh, on Berkshire. I, I don't know if this is more just kind of a rumor, or if this is just you know chatter. But uh, you know, there was uh, I can't remember who the major shareholder in, in Berkshire Hathaway that was is pushing for a special dividend at its coming shareholder meeting. I think it's kind of ridiculous. Who's ever going to see Warren Buffett do this? But yeah. I, know, I know the B shares were, were, were catching a bit on it, surprisingly. I, I just can't believe that anyone would think Warren Buffett would really go for this. I mean, he hasn't budged for how long has he been in the year? In, in, you know, was it 40 years? I mean, come on, he's not going to, you know, with, with Berkshire Hathaway at least, but he hasn't he's never done it in that entire time. Why would he start doing it now and break his principles? That's my take. But. Yeah, I, I have to 100% agree, agree with you on that one. Uh, Burke, uh, we did talk about that stock breaking out from the 120 level uh, and just had a nice spirited run up to 125.91 and got a little bit of a pullback. Uh, you can see the major support at uh, the one just above 122. You had 122.24 low on Friday and then a 122.36 low on the uh on the 10th, so the major support is well defined here. Coming on the upside here, 123.79, the high in the session. Uh, let's keep an eye if it can rally can continue. 124.28 was your high from Friday. So I mean, that kind of rounds out most of the tickers that I was looking at. Kind of go, going more to the, the the broad picture though. I'm, I'm interested in seeing what some of the commodities do today, specifically crude and corn. I don't know if you've looked at corn recently, but um, we know that you know Ukraine is a major corn producer, and so anything that's going on in that region is going to affect corn. I mean, we've kind of been going over this. I feel like, you know, the the whole U Ukrainian crisis has really just been you know <laughs> driven into people's heads. But to be honest, I mean, this is this is one of the this, the, the biggest macro event, at least as far as we understand, this week. Um, you know, not a huge amount of data coming out. Uh, so I think this is really going to be kind of a driver. Um, interested in seeing. What this what this does to corn and what this kind of does. Yeah, to you know general. what I'm uh, I'm with it on the corn signal here. A symbol on uh, Info Rider. Sorry about that, guys. Let me see if I can find it here. I mean, you also got uh, you know, obviously like crude. I got corn. it. Yep. I oh, got nice. corn futures. There you go. <laughs> corn. Mm -hmm. Way to go, man. Let's see if we can uh, get a gleam on this here. Uh, we go by per bushel, right? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay, let me see if I can hone in here a little bit closer. Uh, corn, not a contract we talk about a lot here. Getting a bump up. It looks like, if we got any corn traders here, it looks like just underneath that 490 level, you're finding some good resistance. I do see a spike above it up to uh, 
above 490, but that looks to be the key resistance point after a big run up. Looks like a big run up of some consolidation and perhaps for um, another move to go higher. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, crude oil is probably also going to be affected by that. But, uh, you know, we're, I think a lot of the, um, you know, as far as we're just kind of waiting, I think it's mostly going to be commodities. But uh, you just just watch for the sanctions today. Those those have to be coming out between, I, I would think, between 10 and noon. I don't know if it's going to be a scheduled press conference or if they're just going to bust in and, you know, take over the airwaves. But uh, I think there's the, the sanctions run from economic to possible uh, you know you know shutting down accounts you know foreign accounts in the nation you know the western world so I guess we'll see um, I haven't heard news about major money flows out of like the United States some of these other countries where some of this is expected so I don't know it, it should be interesting but uh Joel I, I know that I've kind of ran rambled on there about uh, Crimea and Ukraine yeah. and all that uh, what are you thinking for the S&P futures today well, it blew through that pre-market high, uh, 13. We were holding in there at 45.75. Got excellent follow-through all the way up to the 18.53 level. The buy the dippers prevail once again here. Uh, made a high, just made that high at 18.53. Uh, we need to go take a look at the dailies here to find some resistance here. So much for the market uh, trading in its every daily range because we've already had a 30-point range here. Kind of in no man's land here. If I had to find a resistance point, I'd have to look at the 1856. Uh, that was a low that you had in 1858 and a quarter. But uh, really, market following through strong. I guess we'll just have to keep an eye on the tape and see if anything uh, comes out to the negative side uh, with the Ukraine. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, the show today. We really hit a lot of different topics, hopefully covering enough stocks for you. We're going to end the show for today. We'll be back with you tomorrow.